Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on another journey into one of my favourite childhood memories and tell you all about my favourite aunt, Auntie Joan, and her wonderful collection of vintage girls' annuals. As usual, this talk will be accompanied by some images on the video, but it's not necessary for you to look at them. If you prefer... You can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you into the past. So, let's travel together back to the time when I was eight years old. Back then, my family would occasionally go to stay with an old friend of my mother's, Joan. The pair of them had been friends for many years, and Auntie Joan was, and still is, my godmother. She wasn't actually my real aunt, but, like many kids of my generation, I was raised to call all my mother's close friends auntie, because my mother was quite old-fashioned and felt it was disrespectful for children to call adults by their first names. So Joan was always Auntie Joan, and I thought she was wonderful. To my eight-year-old self, Auntie Joan was my idea of what a princess should be. She was very tall and elegant, with shoulder-length blonde hair swept back into a ponytail, a beautiful warm smile, twinkly eyes, and a soft, gentle voice. She was full of fun and kindness, and she was married to my Uncle John, who was also a lovely, warm person as well as being very tall, dark and handsome. As a child, Auntie Joan and Uncle John were the closest thing I'd ever seen in real life to a fairy tale couple, and I sometimes thought of them as Cinderella and Prince Charming from the Walt Disney film. Whenever Auntie Joan and Uncle John came to stay with us, or we went to stay with them, we would go out on day trips or out for special meals. However, in between these excursions, Auntie Joan and my mother liked to enjoy a good catch-up, and they would sit and talk for hours and hours. This is a quality I've inherited, as these days I too can happily spend hours chatting away with my friends, especially if I haven't seen them for a while. However, as a child sitting in the background and often by myself. I used to get rather restless during these catch-up sessions for the grown-ups. To pass the time, I would draw, or play imaginary games, or read to myself. And one day, while we were staying at her house, Auntie Joan brought out a pile of books for me to look at. She explained that these were books from her own childhood, annuals that she had loved and treasured as a girl, and that she thought I might enjoy looking at too. I remember being so honoured by this show of confidence, because these books were clearly very precious to Auntie Joan, and so I was thrilled that she wanted to share them with me, and trusted me enough to look after them. I remember my mother warning me very sternly to be extra careful with them. But she needn't have worried, because although I could, at times, be quite a boisterous child, I had even then a deep reverence for books. I remember settling down on the soft sheepskin rug that graced Auntie Joan's living room floor, and which I loved sitting on, and working my way one by one, through this marvellous collection. As I'm sure you know, the term annuals refers to annual publications, or books that are published once a year, and children's annuals are usually offshoots from popular comics, and feature stories, puzzles and pictures. By the time I was eight, I already had my own collection of annuals that I'd inherited from my sister, who's nine years older than me, and who had passed on her own collection once she'd outgrown them. But even though I was familiar with annuals, 
I was intrigued by Auntie Joan's collection, because they didn't look the same as the ones I was used to. To begin with, they were older, they dated mainly from the 1950s, and the covers were very different to my sister's annuals, which were more modern and simpler in their cover design. The covers on Auntie Joan's annuals depicted very detailed scenes, and the colours that had been used to decorate them were softer and more varied. I liked this, and the first annual I looked at had a cover that showed two girls having a picnic by the sea, while in the background there was a speedboat with a water skier, as well as a lighthouse, some more boats, and a village on a hill. I really enjoyed looking at all these details, and I was particularly struck by one of the girls in the foreground, who was standing up and waving to a friend in the distance. I've always remembered her, because she was tall and pretty, with shoulder-length blonde hair, and she reminded me of my Auntie Joan. This first annual was a girl's crystal from 1958, and it seemed to encapsulate a world that, on the one hand, seemed quite familiar, but on the other hand, also seemed slightly strange and distant. For one thing, I couldn't understand the title. Why was it called Girl's Crystal? At first, I thought it might contain a story about a crystal, or a picture of one. But... A brief flick through the contents soon proved me wrong, and I was puzzled by the lack of a crystal connection. However, my eight-year-old self didn't dwell on the problem for long, because I was soon diving into the book itself and discovering a whole world of new stories. Inside the annual, the end papers, by which I mean the inner page of the front cover and the page opposite it, were decorated with a colourful series of pictures on a yellow background, illustrating a schoolgirl quiz. There were different images depicting different things, with a question relating to each one of them, such as, Can you name this famous building in India? Or, Can you name the dresses these girls are wearing? The building in question was the Taj Mahal, and the dresses were crinolines, but my eight-year-old self had no idea about any of this, so I was mystified by most of the questions. The only one I knew the answer to was, Are these birds martins or swifts? I knew the answer was martins, because at the time, I was a keen young ornithologist, and I could tell from the birds' blue and white markings that they were martins. It was a relief to know that I wasn't completely ignorant. But even so, it was also clear to me that this annual had a lot to teach me about the sophisticated ways of the world. On the front piece of the annual, which is opposite the title page, there was another brilliantly coloured picture, this time of a girl at a zoo. But after this, the colours quickly ran out. With a couple of exceptions, the main body of the book was in black and white, and was made up of a mixture of written stories and picture stories, with a few quizzes and puzzles in between. The written stories were laid out on the page in the standard format as a block of text, and they only had a couple of illustrations each to go with them. But the picture stories had a comic strip layout, with an ongoing series of rectangular pictures that told the story. These were my favourite type. And of course, I was familiar with them from the comics I read, as well as from my sister's old annuals. However, although the comic strips in Auntie Joan's annuals looked the same, they didn't read the same, because... The language used in them was somehow different. The lead characters were, for the most part, young girls, but they used some very peculiar and old-fashioned expressions, such as good o, hurrah, jolly super, and, when they wanted to express approval, rather. 
I had come across some of these expressions before in boarding school stories by Enid Blyton, but seeing them in a comic strip was a new and unfamiliar experience. As an adult, with hindsight, I can see that this language was an indication of a particular social class. The girls' crystal annuals were very much aimed at the daughters of the upper middle classes, all the aspiring upper middle classes, that dominated the social and cultural landscape of Britain in the 1950s. However, when I was first reading these annuals, I had no idea about any of this. I just liked the words, because they were so different to what I heard every day in the playground or in TV shows of the time, and their quaint quirkiness added even more to the strange appeal of the girl's crystal annual. The stories I loved best were the ones that involved the heroines in a quest to overcome danger and solve a mystery, and if they happened to be doing it in an exotic or glamorous location, so much the better. In that first annual I looked at, my favourite story was called The Secret of the Silver Locket, and it told the tale of a poor French orphan, Ninette, who was helped by two jolly English girls, Pam and Shirley, to find the missing silver locket that had been left to her by her parents. The locket turns out to have been stolen by Ninette's evil guardian, who isn't actually her real guardian at all, but is simply posing as her guardian in order to use Ninette as cheap labour for his pedalo business on the French Riviera. As the story unfolds, the girls chase a masked troubadour through a carnival, foiling him by knocking him over with a giant carnival head, before finding the locket, escaping from the counterfeit guardian on pedalos, and, eventually, landing on an island where Ninette is finally reunited with her true guardian, a kindly old gentleman who, rather fortuitously, turns out to be very rich, and owns a chateau. Dramatic, far-fetched, and a little bit corny, The Secret of the Silver Locket was typical of the sort of stories I read in The Girl's Crystal, and I loved every single one of them. I can't remember how long we stayed with Auntie Joan on that particular visit. It probably wasn't very long, but it seemed to me at the time that I spent days and days lost in the vintage world of her annuals collection. However, not all of her books were girls' crystals. The pile Auntie Joan had set before me also contained a number of books called The School Friend. In truth, there wasn't a lot of difference between the two. Both The School Friend and The Girl's Crystal shared a similar format, similar types of illustrations, and similar content. However, The School Friend contained one particular comic strip with a set of characters that featured regularly in every annual. The Silent Three. Oh, I loved The Silent Three. They were three girls, Betty, Joan and Peggy who attended the fictional boarding school of St. Kitts, and who had formed a secret society between them, in order to solve mysteries and fight crime. Now, you might think that three posh schoolgirls wouldn't come across many opportunities to fight crime. But you'd be wrong. It was amazing how often the Silent Three were called upon to defeat robbers, crooks, and other nefarious plotters. Betty, Joan and Peggy would go about their good works dressed in long hooded robes that made them look like monks and which they wore with masks to conceal their true identities and work under cover. Although, again, with hindsight, I do wonder if the sight of three hooded and masked figures might not have drawn more attention to their presence as they traipsed about the villages of England. When I was eight years old, I wasn't bothered by such issues of realism. I was simply a huge fan of the Silent Three. 
I longed to form my own secret society and go on thrilling adventures, and I followed their escapades avidly in Auntie Joan's annuals. She had loved them too when she was a girl, and I remember talking to her about them and loving the fact that she was as enthusiastic about the stories as I was. My favourite Silent Three story was called The Silent Three Mermaid Mystery. It tells of how the trio help a girl called Hilary while they're on holiday in Cornwall. Hilary's eccentric uncle has recently died, and he has left Hilary a mysterious message about a mermaid, which seems to make no sense at all. However, when the girls actually see a real mermaid in Starshell Cove, sitting on a rock and combing her long blonde hair, the silent three go in to investigate. Using their monkish robes as a cover, they soon foil the plot of a wicked brother and sister who want to steal Hilary's fortune, and the story ends with them helping Hilary to reclaim her rightful inheritance from her uncle. Another of my favourite Silent Three stories was called A Christmas Mystery for the Silent Three. In this story, Betty, Joan and Peggy go to spend their Christmas holidays with Betty's Uncle Edgar, who is the estate manager for a very large country house called Redcroft Hall. There, the three girls meet Cherry Vance, a former employee at the hall, who was dismissed from her post after being accused of stealing a valuable ruby necklace. Cherry swears she isn't a thief, but Uncle Edgar's secretary, Keith Burden, has dismissed her anyway, and now Cherry is desperate to prove her innocence. Needless to say, the Silent Three do just that, in a plot that involves an enigmatic puzzle, a lost key, and a secret compartment inside an old wooden chest. The dastardly Keith Burden turns out to be the real thief, and the story ends with Cherry restored to her job and raising a Christmas toast to her new friends, the Silent Three. As you'll gather from these two story descriptions, the plots of the Silent Three's adventures were all rather similar and rather cheesy. But I didn't care. I soaked up every single one of their stories, and they even inspired me to make up some adventures of my own. Back in my own home, after our visit to Auntie Joan was over, I told my best friend, Charlotte, all about the Silent Three, and together we became the Silent Two. We draped ourselves in blankets in lieu of hooded robes, and we marauded around the house and garden, pretending to solve mysteries and fight crimes. I remember that on one occasion, we even sneaked out into the street, which we weren't supposed to do, in order to look for clues. In the little cobbled alleyway that ran along the back of our garden, we found a crumpled scrap of paper with the words Smith and Allen written on them. Charlotte and I soon decided that these words must be the names of two villains, and so we proceeded to invent a convoluted plot that involved Smith and Alan stealing a secret treasure and hiding it somewhere in the alley, and we set out at once to find the treasure and return it to its rightful owner. Alas, we never did find this imaginary treasure, and we never tracked down the villains Smith and Alan either. It was probably just as well. I'm not sure how two wide-eyed eight-year-old girls would have coped with apprehending a couple of jewel thieves. Over time, our Silent Two games were replaced with other games, as new preoccupations overtook us and new adventures were imagined. But on my next visit to see Auntie Joan, I asked her if I could look at her old school friend and girls' crystal annuals once again and I enjoyed reading them just as much the second time around. I've read them again 
many times since. I have my own small collection of 1950s vintage annuals now, most of which I've bought from car boot sales, charity shops and second-hand bookshops. Every so often, I take one of them down from the bookcase and dive back into that jolly super world that I first discovered at my Auntie Joan's house. I still love the front covers, those beautiful, finely drawn 50s illustrations that show cheerful young girls at the beach, at the ballet, or skiing on a snowy slope. They are so redolent of a bygone age, and the stories inside are also still great fun to read, even now, because the corniness of the plots is more than compensated for by the spirit of innocent enthusiasm and joie de vivre that pervades every single adventure. Even though they're very much of their era, there's something rather endearing about these tales in which girls help each other out and also help to right wrongs. They might have been frightfully posh, but the heroines of The School Friend and The Girl's Crystal also embody many fine qualities. Honesty, generosity, a sense of camaraderie, and a willingness to be the best versions of themselves. These girls are brave, ingenious, and independent. And when I was growing up, in the late 1970s and early 80s, there weren't that many brave, ingenious and independent girl role models for me to look up to in popular culture. So for all their jolly hockey sticks approach, the Silent Three and the other plucky heroines in the annuals were a kind of inspiration. I think they had probably also inspired Auntie Joan when she was a girl herself. Because once she was grown up, she went on to forge a trailblazing career as a policewoman, at a time when to do so was a rare and challenging thing for a woman. I didn't really think much about this aspect of her life when I was a child. She was just my kind and beautiful Auntie Joan. But now, when I look back, I see that she was herself a brave, ingenious and independent role model and I wonder how much she was herself inspired by the heroines of those thrilling stories in her annual collection. I'm so grateful to her for introducing me to these wonderfully charming and entertaining books. And if you haven't read any for yourself, I would recommend investigating the world of vintage girls' annuals. As well as The Girl's Crystal and School Friend, there are also many other titles to choose from, and you can still pick up old, random volumes relatively cheaply, on eBay, in bookshops, or at vintage markets. Rather marvellously, you can also read some of the original comic strip stories online, including The Silent Three. I'll put a link for them in the description below the video, in case you want to check out any of them for yourself. I hope you've enjoyed this cosy trip down memory lane with me, into the splendid world of vintage girls' annuals. I hope, too, that you can join me again soon for another relaxing ASMR adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.